Come on. Who got some real Stand love in their in life? Place. Come on. You can stand. It's okay. <laughs> Bishop's looking on the TV like, what is going on in that place? All right. How many of y'all are searching for a real love? How many of y'all have found a real love? How many of you are single and you're like, I found a real love? His name is Jesus. That's right. Good morning. Is today Super Bowl Sunday? It is? Who are you rooting for, baby? Dallas Cowboys. Are they not playing? Are they not? They're not playing. Actually, I'm rooting for the Eagles. See, the way I figured it is, is that the NFC East is like the greatest division ever in the world of football. And you have the Redskins like with three Super Bowls. Okay, you have the here. Giants with four. The careful. Cowboys with five. And then the Eagles got like one. Y'all need to step up, man. Don't even show your face here next week if y'all don't pull it out with your measly one Super Bowl. He loves you. He's just teasing. We clearly, we know the scripture about a house divided, so we are That's right. all of us. <laughs> down to the socks. Down to the kids. That's right, down to the kids. <laughs> We had a great weekend in this we place. Have. We have. There were oh, almost 150 of us here yesterday. Who was here with us? Maybe you were with us online. We just had a great time leaning in to understand how do we make our relationships stronger? How do we make our marriages stronger? How do we prepare our hearts, those of us that are, are seeking to be married? So we, it was just a great, great morning. And we wanted to thank um, all of you who came out first and foremost, and then all of you who served. We can't do it without just the willingness and the selflessness of so many who say yes to Sometimes the last minute calls, sometimes the inconvenient calls. So we had a great time with you yesterday. And we're going to continue this morning as we talk about real love. We unpacked this last week of this real love that God has for us, especially first with him, then with each other. And marriage is such a big part of that, but family and all relationships really have this heart of oneness that God created. Because in the beginning, we see that God created the heavens and the earth. And that God is not alone in his creation. God is a triune God. He is one. He is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He's a relational God. And when he created man and put him in the beauty of this garden, we also see that Man was not fulfilled because man was not one. Man did not have a suitable helpmate, and God created woman. And they became one flesh, the Bible says. They became one flesh. It's such a sacred part of the human existence. It is the bedrock of humanity, of us being one with God, and then God creating the family before he can do anything else, before the story of this world could ever unfold, he created man and woman in marriage. And there's so many stories out there of love stories, of what God has done, what God is doing, what God is continuing to do and will do, no matter where we are in, in our lives. And today, this morning, we want to share our love story. Are you ready? Are you a little nervous? I feel like this is the first time I've ever been on this platform. <laughs> <laughs> We're excited. I I'm a little nervous. Yeah. And for those of you that you may be single or widowed or married, you know, with grandchildren, do not check out. Yeah. What our heart is to share in our story is to talk about 
different points of life that we believe connect with everybody, no matter who we are in this place, listening online. So I think for everybody in here, God has something he wants to share with us today. And more importantly, give you a little, you know, see behind the curtain to the, just the Marco and Lauren. That's right. You know, and who we are and what God has done in our life to bring us here to this moment. And this is a topic we're so passionate about. And I think through the story, you'll see why. Because when we've had to fight for something, once we have it, it's a little sweeter. Can anyone relate with that? When you've had to really work for something, once you get it, you appreciate it more. And I think that's how we live today in, in our relationship. So let's start with the word of God. Do it. Ephesians 5, verse 31 For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. Whoever each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must must respect her husband. That's right. And I love in the beginning of that teaching or that writing of Paul, back in verse 21, where he starts this off, he says, right, he says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So this is a mutual thing of love, of, re- of submission, of respect, and it is beautiful and powerful. And it is, like Lauren said, something that beats on our hearts. So let's jump right in. Chapter one. We have eight chapters in this love story. In the beginning. In the beginning. So for me, for those of you that don't know, I am a first-generation Italian-American. My parents came over on the boat in the 60s, and they were, I I don't have, I mean, my parents loved each other. I grew up in a loving home on the east side of Bridgeport, and my, my parents grew up and, and brought us through Catholic school. We we're Roman Catholic. And we, I grew up, especially with the friends and the families around us, something I had, and I always knew it as young, there was something different. And it was that love, the home, the parents, and even God. But something about a woman I just fell in love with. And I don't say, I say that in a way that growing up, it's my worship was I wanted to be in that perfect relationship. I wanted the perfect girl, and that's where I would be happy. And I didn't want nothing to do with God. I stopped going to church. I didn't read my Bible. I didn't do any of those things. And I just chased after that perfect, that perfect relationship. And it was funny because even as a teenager, I never really dated because Almost, if any of you watch Seinfeld, any Seinfelds, some Seinfeld people, listen, you know. So Jerry would always break up with girls over, like, the stupidest things. Be like, did you see how she ate her peas? I can't be with somebody that will eat her peas one at a time, right? And it was almost like that, that nothing, no, I was, oh, there's always a flaw. Nothing was good enough because I always wanted that woman that I could worship, because that's where I would then find my purpose, my happiness in life. And that was really at the beginning uh, for my story. And what happened was around 22 years old, I met a girl. And I thought that she was what I've been searching for since I was 9, 10 years old and dreaming about. And this was it. Happiness, purpose, joy, life. It was now coming. But the thing was, was I was chasing after a superficial relationship, what the world taught me. And once I got into this relationship, I was miserable. I wasn't happy. I was actually the least happy I've ever been in my entire life. And, but I was, almost felt stuck in this, like, and so down, like, this is what I waited my whole life for? This is what I was chasing and worshiping. Man, there's got to be more than life than this. So that's kind of like my beginning. What about yours? We've been married 13 years now. I still get tight listening <laughs> to that. Like, I, I can't like, stand it. 
I had I'm a girlfriend when I was seven years old. Oh, don't let me see her at the mall. I'm still working on the, I'll, you know, love I'll is not jealous me. part. I'm working on it. We're all a work in progress. <laughs> you know, a lot of little girls dream about being a mom or maybe a teacher or a doctor. When I was a little girl, I, <laughs> from the, the youngest of age, I remember dreaming about being a successful woman in my mind that meant I was going to be all dressed up for work. I was going to be wearing stilettos and some fabulous bag. I was going to be working in New York City, the big city mindset. And I wanted, it was all about a, a career for me and what that looked like, how the world kind of defined success. Um, you know, I, I actually never thought I was going to be a mom. I um, had, I didn't yet understand or I, what, I didn't know what the Bible taught about relationships, what we just read. So instead, it was really the world that defined how I thought about marriage, how I defined and, and looked at relationships. And I used to say when I was little, I don't mind working hard. Like I'm, I'm going to make for myself. I'm going to make my own money and like I can do this. I, I'm, you know, I, I got this basically. And um, at the same time, I was, I was around 12. My mom and my aunt, we had just lost my grandfather. And I too, we too were, were brought up Catholic. And I remember my mom saying, I just want more out of a church experience. I want more out of my relationship with God. So my mom and my aunt, who are both on the front row with us today, brought us to this crazy church down the street. They played loud music and prayed in a language. I was like, what the heck is that? And I remember being a 12-year-old little girl on the front row with her arms crossed for months and months and months, <laughs> hating every moment. But like a good mama, she made me come to church with her. And, uh, and this crazy place was called Kingdom Life, in case you're not following. And what's funny about that is at the same time, I'm 22 years old in this relationship that is not fulfilling and I feel lost. And out of the blue, she starts going to church. And I was Not like, me, this woman that will remain nameless. I think they understood that. I just wanted to make sure. You, you were 12, okay? <laughs> she was not in the picture yet. Okay, so... <laughs> So she started going to church, and she was, and then she was like, hey, I'm going to church. I was church. What kind of church? Oh, this non-denominational church. I was like, what? What does that even mean? She was like, you want to come? No. Bring me home the newspaper and an egg sandwich. You know, that, that's kind of. And then one Sunday she came home, and she gave me kind of like an ultimatum. And that's all we'll call it, an ultimatum. That's and, all the info you're getting. And she was like, I need you to come to church, or else this is kind of over. And I was like, what time service? <laughs> you know? And I walked into this church, and I remember it being packed. There was cameras going around, you know, people worshiping, clapping their hands, shouting. I'm like, what is this? I kind of saw something like this on public access when I was watching the Jerry Jer show, right? For those of you that remember. And I was like... So I remember, like, the camera going around, and I was ducking out of the camera. And it was Kingdom Life Christian Church. And God brought us, you know, through different ways to this church in the same time back in 1995. Mm -hmm. And for me, this is chapter two of when we're getting to meeting Jesus. We literally came to this place. And for me... It was eye-opening. I didn't like the music at first. I was like, there's something weird about this worship and stuff, you know? It's like, is it a club? Is it a concert, you know? <laughs> Somebody came through the first time and like, they're dancing to Mary J. What's happening here, <laughs> right? But for me, Bishop started to speak. Mm. And I remember 
it just gravitated. I was just like, what is this? And I began to hear the word of God and began to hear the things of God. And I wrestled with the things of God. I began to like, is this real? Is Jesus real? I don't want anything that's fake. I don't want to just be a person that just goes to church. I already did the religious thing. Is this real? And it wasn't until bump into Pastor Mike, who we went to high school with, and Pastor Mike invited me to a young adult's gathering. So some of you young adults, you heard that invite for this Saturday. Make sure you go. That's because right. it was when I went to this young adults gathering with about 10 young adults, because my mindset before that was this Jesus thing is kind of like world peace. Everybody believes in it, but it's not really practical. It's not going to happen. It's never going to be. And that's what I was like, yeah, this Christian thing, this Jesus thing, it's good in theory, but it's never really going to be. So then what ended up happening, I went to this young adult meeting, and it was the first time in my life I started to hang around with kids my age that looked like me, that spoke like me, that dressed like me, and saw it is real. They're living it out, and God, if they're going to live it out, then I want it. And what happened, long story short, I came to this place where I broke down and I was like, Pastor Mike, I need to talk. And we walked down by the water and I gave my life to the Lord. And in that moment when I said this prayer, Jesus, I believe in you, forgive me. It was a breaking. And then from there we went straight to Friday night prayer. And I cried for two hours straight. <laughs> I didn't know what was happening. I was like, God, what's going on? I can't stop crying. And literally what happened was God literally cleansed me and made me new. All the junk I won't even go into of my upbringing, of running on the streets, of all the stuff, was just, I was made new. And Bishop, I never spoke to him, and I didn't speak to him for a long time after this. He put his hand on me walking down the aisle. I was, I, he didn't know who I was, and he spoke a word over me, and he said, in 10 years, God is going to give you, I mean, in one year, God is going to give you the wisdom and insight that would normally take 10 years to acquire. And within that year, I was a youth leader. I was a children's director. I was on a mission trip leading teenagers in El Salvador before 12 months was over. I went all in. And when it came that very night, my girlfriend broke up with me. And I remember crying out to God and saying, God, why? We're both Christians now. We can make this work. God, we can do this. And God said, Marco, your whole, clear as day. Marco, your whole life, you worshiped women. And you didn't want nothing to do with me. Today, I have used the very thing you false worshiped to bring you to me. And now that you have me, you don't need any woman to find your worth. <laughs> Little did I know, for 10 years, I wouldn't go on a date. I wouldn't get a number. I wouldn't have coffee. There was nothing for 10 years as I just jumped into the things of God. Because my mindset was, God, I either want your promise and what you say when it comes to marriage, into a relationship, into a family, or nothing. And I'll just be good being a good Christian and serving and running the youth ministry. So when I was 12 on an Easter Sunday, that's when I accepted Jesus. I had my grandmother next to me and I, what we used to do at the time, like that long walk down the aisle up to the front. And, and at the time it was, our bishop was Pastor Jay and it was <laughs> Pastor Jay who led me to the Lord. I was baptized, I was filled with the Holy Spirit. And Pastor Jay <laughs> said for like, it felt, it felt like hounding. I don't know if it actually was, but that's what it felt like to this 12-year-old. Lauren, when are you going to check out youth group? Lauren, they meet on Wednesday nights. When are you going to go down there? Okay, Lauren, this is the last time I'm going to ask you, have you checked out youth group yet? I'm like, all right, fine. I can be a little rebellious, but I don't consider myself to be disobedient. So, and there is, that is a fine line. So I'm like, okay, I got it. I got to get down there because he's going to ask me again. So I head down to, to youth group and yours truly over here is the, at the time, youth leader. Youth so leader. youth leader of, of youth group. I get really involved, um, love Jesus 
But even during this time, the way I described how I thought about the world growing up, it was really like the things of this, this world, just meaning like what I thought success looked like, what I thought fun looked like, was all more appealing to me than this thing called Christianity, this walk with Jesus. It lured me more, the world lured me more than what I thought a relationship with God and with Jesus really looked like. So I went through high school, you know, again, my parents, and at this time, it it was both of them, forcing me to be at church. And they did that. And you know what? Can I tell you, parents? Even though I wasn't all in, there were seeds planted over the course of a decade. There were encounters with Jesus that happened. There were experiences, even though I may have had my arms crossed in the front row, that would have never happened had my parents not had me be in this building or, or watching online. So maybe that's a little encouragement to some of you. Mamas, if your knees are raw praying for your kids, continue praying because right. can I tell you, it matters. It matters. <laughs> Seeds are planted on earth and in the heavens. So put some aquaphor on those knees and, and keep going. Go ahead. <laughs> So at this point, I still had kind of my, my current views of the world. Can I tell you, I remember being in Pastor Mike's car. There were like five of us, five of us teenagers in the back seat. Apparently, we weren't all that into like our church insurance policy at that point in time. And <laughs> it was a different day. And the conversation is going. And I'm just kind of listening and being quiet in the back seat. There are actually maybe a couple of people here that were in the back seat with me. And I remember the conversation turning to marriage. And I remember someone forcing me into the conversation and saying, well, Lauren, you know, what do you think? Lauren, would you ever be a pastor's wife? <laughs> I snorted. It was like, <laughs> no, maybe, maybe that's not what it was. But like one of those things like, are you kidding me? Like that would never, ever, ever, <laughs> ever happen. The, the words that came out of my mouth next were, I would rather be a pastor than a pastor's wife. You might let get me, both. Let me just tell you, <laughs> be careful with your nevers because they normally become reality. Okay? So any of you that are saying never, just watch your words there. Watch your words. Um, you know, I also, summer camp was, was really important there, too. Where are we? Before you, you can yeah. find your spot, for me in this time was I gave up when I came to the church the world that I knew. I had God clearly, and I gave up my friends. You know, I, I gave up so much. So I basically just had church, and I was here. But God drew, connected me to this amazing family the Vargos. And literally, I was there two, three nights a week. I would be cooking dinner, you know, for them. My husband can throw down, in case you don't know this. He is a phenomenal cook. He used to make us feasts, right? It'd be like a Tuesday night. It'd be like 10 o'clock at night, and Marco's like preparing this ridiculously (laughs) elaborate dinner. You know, so Lauren ended up in this season becoming like a little sister to me in the youth ministry and during high school. Her two younger sisters that were, you know, seven and nine at the time, I used to tuck them into bed and read them Bible stories. Ashley used to roll her eyes at me. She, she still, st- still her rolls eyes her at eyes you. at me. You know, so it literally was God, you know, brought this season together and the Vargos became, we became like family all the way back then. So during this time, I'm off, you know, I'm a, I'm a high schooler and I think I'm so cool and I'm in this, I get into this relationship, this five-year relationship. I go off to, off to school. All the things I said I was going to do, work hard, is exactly what, what I did. You know, so good education, worked during it. I come home from school, for, I graduate from college and I call Marco uh, over the summer and I'm like, hey, what do you think if I go to summer camp? this year? Is there any spots? Do you need any help? I just, like, I, I, I want to go. And he said yes. Absolutely. <laughs> Summer camp. 
another, another nudge or any experience we can have where it's just a mountaintop experience. What does that mean? Getting away from the noise of your every day and having space where God can speak to you. And that's exactly what he did for me at summer camp when I had graduated college. And at the time, it was, Lauren, you need to break up with this boy that you've been, you've been dating for a few years. I thought we were going to get married. I thought, like, that was the, that was the plan. But I, She gets mad at me. <laughs> You're over here thinking about marriage, huh? I was just chilling. <laughs> That's worse for the record. That's worse for the record. That's worse. You're probably right. You're We're going right. to move on. We're going to move on. So <laughs> chapter three. God speaks in stereo. In stereo. What does he say? So this time Lauren comes back. She comes to summer camp and she's like, no offense to the other leaders that were there. She's like amazing. Just rocking it out just a natural you can see he's not biased or anything he's not you can see God's call on her life and she becomes part of youth ministry so now she's in youth ministry and for me what ends up happening is it's great to have my little sister that I've been praying for for years to be come back to church and then there was this Christmas party. Hold on, at the before King's the Christmas house. party. Before, because I want to get to this. Look at the. Before right. the Christmas party, our relationship went for from mentor mentee to friendship. It really yeah. started shifting, and that's so important because a lot of times we just jump to I want to be in a romantic relationship. We really started cultivating that friendship because the first ten years he really was my big brother, my mentor. We never talked about him. He asked me a gazillion questions about myself and pushed me and stretched me in my faith. But she it was- still has to pull it out. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. But really, it was that friendship that was established for a, a number of months. Okay, yeah. now the Christmas party. So now- This is my favorite part of the story. This is her favorite. My favorite part's coming. So, <clears throat> so this, we're at the Kane's house, Bill and Rachel Kane, their youth leaders- and we're at their house, and we're having our youth leader Christmas party. And Lauren is across the room. And just all of a sudden, like a light from heaven. And I'm not fooling around. Literally, it was a lamp, but it was like a light. <laughs> the glow on the wattage just automatically doubled on this lamp. And it just shined on her. And, and it was the first time in my life that I was like, oh, that's not a little girl anymore. That's a woman. And that woman is beautiful. And I remember to this day how her hair was. I remember what she was wearing. I remember the necklace she had on, the jacket, the little curls in her hair. And I was like, wow. And I just remember all, like, immediately, like, feeling bad. Like, well, stop that. That's your little sister. You can't have those feelings. But I remember now going through this process of not bringing it to God because for 10 years, I literally had not one interest. I could honestly say I never even really took a double look. Guys, you know what I'm talking about, that double look? You know, when that woman walks by, you They're you being look all at her. quiet, but they know exactly yeah. what you mean. Yeah, like my wife's next to me. Please don't say this. They did this to you when they saw you, okay? There you so, go. <laughs> and then you walk by, and then you take that double look. You're like, oh, look at that. So that double... I'm, I can't even remember doing a double look for 10 years. And now I'm starting to have these feelings. So I just literally start praying. I don't just jump all over it and act because I now have these feelings. Oh, they must be from God. I literally, okay, God. And this is December. God, is there something here? There's no way that if this isn't you, there's no way I can blow this up. I'm, their parents are... Their family, their friends, they work on staff, their, their parents. God, this has to be you. So I'm just praying and praying. Literally February comes, so about three months later, Pastor Mike, my best friend, is like, Marco, can we talk? Of course we can talk. We want to talk about, let's talk about Lauren. And I'm like, 
What about Lauren? You had just preached a series on relationships. We did. We just did a series on relationships on a Wednesday night. And I would happen to be in the room. And at that same, during that, that series, I was sitting in the room with my mom next to me. And as Pastor Mike and Marco were teaching, I got this, this thought, sense, feeling. Huh. That's your husband's. And I remember having the same reaction. God, I'm so sorry. I don't know where that thought came from. I am so sorry. Please forgive me. Like, I don't know what that was all about. But not being able to shake it. So when Pastor Mike had come to Marco, they had just talked about the concept of covering. Yeah, so we talked about this important principle of covering. No matter what we do in life, we need wisdom. We need experience, trusted Elders, parents, friends, pastors, leaders, all in our life. So I have this and I preach it. And Pastor Mike comes and says, is the opposite true? I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, well, you can see somebody, you, you preach that if you find somebody, you will bring them to your covering. You'll bring, a, bring that person to Bishop and to us and say, what do you guys think about this? But is the opposite true? And I'm like, what are you talking about? What if we see somebody? Are you willing to hear what we have to say? Now I'm playing it cool. I'm like, well, maybe. Well, who are you, who are you, who are you talking you got about? For me? What you what got for me? What are you looking me? at? You know. And then I'm he says, and then he says, now here is my circle of trust, right? Like, you know, meet the parents. I have a circle of trust. Of course, there's Bishop and Janine, true covering, but that accountability, that circle of trust of my best friends, Pastor Mike and Gina. Minister Sandy and Johnny and Bill and Rachel Kane. These are these three couples that are my best friends who I do life with. And Pastor Mike says, I've been talking to the Canes and to the Vargos. I was like, what? Who, you, you, talk, you guys are talking about me and who? And he, he was like, Lauren. And I'm like, Lauren? I play it off, you know, just, what? <laughs> Lauren, I don't know about that. Okay, I'll pray about it, okay. And then I walk away like, oh my gosh, God. <laughs> Is this real, God? So then like a month goes by of me just like praying on this. And I can't stress enough not to just jump on your feelings and act on what you feel in a moment. Time always is your best ally. Okay? So I remember one day in a staff meeting, I, after it was over, I was like, Bishop, do you mind if... Uh, we, can we talk real quick? He was like, what's wrong, Marco? And I'm like, nothing's wrong. He was like, okay, what's up? And I was like, there's this woman in the church that I'm kind of interested in. I haven't talked to her yet, but I'm kind of having feelings. And, and know what he says to me? Who, Lauren? <laughs> I was like, you talking to Pastor Mike? He's like, no, I'm not talking to Pastor Mike. He was like, you want to know? Back in the summer, now this is March, back in August when you were at my house for my daughter's birthday party in August, right after summer camp, after, you know, because Lauren was there with her family, I was there, he was like, after everybody left, it was the topic of the Ramirez conversation. My daughters noticed and saw something. I was like, your daughters and your teenagers. I was like, what are you talking about? Or just, you know, in their 20s. And I was like, what are you talking about? He's like, me and Janine. I was like, why didn't you say something to me back then? He's like, no, no. God showed us and we've been praying. But God got to show you. But he was like, yes, we do see this, Marco. And at the same time, my parents that don't go to this church know the Vargos because we were family. So my parents knew the Vargos. My mother and dad would just out of the blue would say, there are no nice girls at your church. What's the matter with you? You know, there's no nice girls. He was like, what about that Vargo girl? And I'm like, what do you talk? Did Pastor Mike talk to you? <laughs> and they're like, no. So here... I'm telling you, confirmation is so powerful. When you have God's voice in stereo, God's talking to me. My bishop and Janine's talking to me. My best friends, my parents. I'm ready to, like John Legend, ready to go right now. 
That's the Ready second to song go. we're going to get people to leave this church yeah. today. <laughs> <laughs> I swear we listen to a lot of worship at home. <laughs> so, so for me, in the end of this chapter three of God speaking in, chair, in, in stereo, for me is that I now waited 10 years. And now God has clearly spoke. So now I want this tomorrow. I waited long enough. I'm ready to get married tomorrow. Where are you at? Marco, Marco told me I, I am the villain of this story. So just I'm maybe, Noah in this story. If you watch yourself. the notebook, I'm Noah. <laughs> okay, the good part's about to come. There's, there's no real good story without a little conflict. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> so remember my thoughts on being a pastor's wife. Like, this was not happening. But we broached the awkward of most awkward conversations over the phone over the phone because we could not uh, do this face to face is, um so laura i'm um I so i'm like a so grown man i feel like i'm 11 years old and you know in middle school uh, uh oh my stomach oh, <laughs> what are you trying to say uh, i don't know uh, i kind of you know if you i kind of like you i think but, <laughs> but, but. but you know what even that awkward conversation it was never oh, I think you're cute, you want to start dating. In, that, in those discussions, it was, we think this is what God has. Like, I think you're the person God has for me. I, we think we're supposed to be together. And that was really our heart about it. It wasn't like, let's, you know, oh, I'm attracted, let's start this dating thing. It was like, okay, we, we believe we're hearing from God, so now what? And this is what we should do, not just in relationships, but everything in our life that truly matters. That's right. That's right. Everything. Like yeah. big decisions. Do we actually bring them? Do we allow leadership and covering to speak over? That could be a new job. That could be, you know, you're you're thinking about becoming parents. Like whatever it is, this principle is is vital, I think, to really being able to navigate life successfully with God's hands on it. But anyway, so we're having these conversations and we're like, okay. You know, yeah, I, I agree. We're, we're going to do this. Okay, okay you know, let, let's do this. It was three weeks. Three of the greatest weeks of my life. It's amazing. Three weeks where we are like, okay, let's do this. We start telling people, when I say we, I mean Marco. We start telling people. Telling everybody. We're very excited. I mean Marco. We're very <laughs> excited about this relationship. And... I remember being in a car and we're driving to like New Haven for like a youth leaders dinner. We used to do youth leaders. We just did everything together. And I remember literally putting my hand. Because my you didn't pinky, have a girlfriend. I know. I remember putting my pinky over and my pinky touching her pinky. <laughs> and my heart being like. <laughs> oh, and then she like reciprocated. I was like, oh. And I remember just. Uh, <laughs> oh. Ooh, watch the road! Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So It was the most chill the youth leaders had ever seen their pastor. <laughs> so, all right. Three weeks, and Marco's ready to go. Marco's all in. He would, he would have gotten married a month later. Yes. This was not God. This was not my plan for my life. I was never going to be a pastor's wife. I was adamant. I was in the city. I was working. I was doing everything I thought I was going to. She had a job in New York and finance that you were working in. And this was kind of like throwing a wrench in it. And bottom line, at the end of those three weeks, it was like, I, I'm not, this is God. I don't want this. This is not what I want. I don't doubt that this is what you're saying to me, but this is not what I want. So there was only one thing to do, and that was to run. And boy, did I run. Run away as fast as you can. No, <laughs> but she was running. And for me, I literally pushed her out the door. I didn't know it then because I knew this was God. I knew this was God's will. So I tried to force it to happen. I tried to control God's promise for my life. I tried to control God's will for my life and do it myself. I didn't understand about God's process now. 
Because God spoke and I want it. So since God said it, it has to happen now. And God's like, no, there's a process. So for me, all of my relational issues that I had at 22 years old as, you know, somebody that wasn't saved, I didn't deal with those. My controlling nature, I didn't deal with trying to control everything and keep it tight and, you know, and even manipulate things when necessary to make sure I controlled everything about my life. So now I get in this relationship and it's God, so now I'm trying to control it. I'm trying to make it happen. But little did I know, I'm just making her yeah. run. So chapter four was trying to control God's plan, yep. which led us into chapter five. The wilderness. So, chapter five, the wilderness. Lauren was gone for two years. Let, let me just set that in context, two years. okay? My parents were on staff at this church. I was, I grew up in this house. We had friends. When I tell you I ghosted, like, I think I, I, think I coined. I, I defined ghosted before it was actually a term. I did not speak to anyone Thank for God two years. Thank God there was no years. social media back then. That's right. Because I would have been on it every day just stalking. Stalking. Like, stalking. Oh, Calling up. It's funny because my best friends during this time of my life became all of the females. It became, you know, Rachel and Sandy. Traitors. You were all team you know, like, Traitors. What I, what's going on? And what for me... And what happened in this wilderness part for me, before I let Lauren talk about it, is it, it, for me, my world crumbled. And I know you're like, how can that happen? It was three, three weeks. It was three weeks. <laughs> how could, but for me, it was God's promise. And I opened up a part of my heart that I never opened. And I gave myself completely. The time did not matter. That's why emotional oneness and your, your heart matters so much. And to be careful who you give it to. Because once I opened it, it was closed for 10 years. But once I opened it and God approved that opening, not the way I opened it, but was like, yes, I couldn't close it. And I, be, I, didn't, I couldn't find joy in ministry. I couldn't find joy in everyday life no more. For two years, I literally you know, was sad or walking around depressed and just trying to overcome, but at the same time praying for the prodigal to come home because that was God's promise. So I'm like, God, I'm praying. I'm praying she's coming home. Whatever she's doing in that world, she's coming home. So I'm doing what I what I had laid out to do, you know, climbing that proverbial corporate ladder, um, traveling and, you know, having friends in, in New York City and spending a ton of time there. But you can, you can run, but you can't hide for too long. Yeah. And this was always home. And even while I was doing that, I never, I never doubted what God said or what his plan was. I was just fighting it. When you hear the voice of God, you know. And that may be, you may say, look, I've never heard God's voice audibly. You know the still small voice that's in you. When something gets dropped in you that you can't shake, that makes no sense, like you know it's God. Don't doubt it. Don't try to make excuses. We can run from that. But don't ever doubt God's voice in your life. And I couldn't run. I got to a place where I couldn't run anymore, where things just started getting, you know, what I thought I wanted. It wasn't as fulfilling anymore. So I had to come home. Back then, we used to have the pastor sit on the stage. Some of you remember that? We used to sit all over there. And literally for two years, I was praying for Lauren to come back home, for the prodigal to come home. And every Sunday, I would look in the crowd for her. You might think that's crazy, but I would pray, God, she's going to come home. Where is she? So two years later, she comes home. She was sitting back there. And I was so excited. 
I got butterflies all up here. I'm up here. I'm like, Bishop's trying. I have no idea what Bishop's talk preaching on. <laughs> you know, like, oh my gosh. You know, and then I look a little bit closer. And the prodigal came home with a boyfriend. Oh, oh, oh. Why? Why? You are evil. Evil. Oh. He's so dramatic. As if this isn't bad enough. Get up. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, it was. So this is what I did. I'm glad you all think it's so funny. I'm so glad. I told her they were going to be on my side in this story. Like that. I told you. You said I'm the villain. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> so... And this is what happened to me in that moment or that season is that I was like, God, relationships are two ways. All your other promises for me, I control me and you. But when it comes to me and her, if she runs from this promise, I'm not going to bear the fall for that. I'm not going to reap the consequences of her decision. So God, you are such a merciful and gracious God. You make a new way where there was no way. So God, you are going to make plan B into my new plan A and she's right over there. That's right. That's right. Do you hear that part everybody? Have yeah, a they, big reaction they understand. to that one. No, they understand. <laughs> they understand. <laughs> so, so in that moment in this season, I literally start another relationship with another person in this church. And it was, there you go, you got one Thank reaction. You. Thank, you. Go. Thank you. <laughs> Team Marco, that's it. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so, but here's the deal is, I remember trying to go through those same things, praying to God, God, is this it? not really hearing God's voice clearly, but saying, okay, God, in your silence, you're not saying no. So, okay. So you start to make reasonings around it to make it fit your narrative and your desires and your feelings and what you want because the pain of this was just too hard for me. Every so then I talked to Bishop. There's this other girl, and Bishop, you know, the cool thing about leadership in this church is, it really isn't controlling or like, no, you're, Bishop's like, you're going to have to figure this out. So he's like, Marco, I don't know. Take it slow and cultivate a friendship. I heard that like, yes, Bishop said yes. <laughs> you know, I talked to my friends and they're like, uh, you sure? I'm not sure. You know, Sandy just went silent on me. Minister Sandy, like Minister Sandy would just... You know, now I, I knew she was praying. I knew God was showing her stuff. And she was just seeing visions and interceding. All of them were. And I was like, I, I'm, God, you're going to make plan A out of plan B because that isn't it. And we literally now were in this season of the prodigal came home, but we were in relationships with other people while doing church together every week. My mom used to say to me, Lauren, did God tell you this is the person he has for you? And I'd look at her with like all the sass in the world. Well, he didn't tell me that he wasn't, you know, and I think that we, we make, ex, you know, we make excuses, but here's what we had to live through. And this is where it's like all kidding aside. Yeah. We hurt people in the process when we do things that are out of God's will, out of what he's calling us to do, there are repercussions. And that's not just for us. That's, that's for all of us, you know. And, and that's, the, that's the worst part of the story because when you know better, you, you know better. And you can avoid things. And God's like, I, you know, I have the plan for you, but are, what are you going to do? Because when you take matters into your own hands, you create roadkill along the way. And that is real people, real hearts, and, and real spirits that have to then be, and souls that have to then be restored as, as a part of it. And we learned that the hard way. Yeah. And I remember the feeling of just like, 
God, I, I know this isn't you, but, you know, uh, it's better than nothing. Mm. And I just, what, it is the best thing to truly hear God and turn, make that change in your life right now if you're in that place. You know, you have people here in this church that will help you, walk you through it. But man, it, it, being obedient to God, and right in this, in this chapter is, you know, time to finally die. Yeah. Right? It's time for us to finally die. So for me. Now this starts getting to my best part of the story. <laughs> so for me, the root, of the, the root of all this, it was never about Marco. For me, it was always, God, how much do I trust you with my life? in my life. You know, I had I never once doubted the realness of God or his love or how good he was. But in terms of making it really practical, God, do I trust that your plan for my life is better than what I think I can do in my own strength? And that's what for me I had to that was the breaking. That was what what had to die. So I remember it was Good Friday, so it was Easter time, and we were having a Good Friday service here. And if you've ever been with us where we've done a, um, a, we call it our cross service, there's a huge cross up in the front, like the size that Jesus was, was nailed to. And there you have these red pieces of paper, and you, you write, like, what do you nail to the cross? What do you need to give to the Lord? And I remember on my piece of paper writing, you know, God, I trust you with my life and all components. And I brought it down to this, this platform and a huge cross with a big red piece of paper and a nail and a hammer, hammering that thing into the cross. And for me, it was that moment where it was, God, none of this makes sense. None of this is clear. I don't get this. I'm kind of annoyed with you. I'm kind of annoyed with the way this has to go. But you know what? I realize that I have to trust you with all of me, with everything I am. And that's what I'm going to do in this moment and for my life. And that night, I got a phone call. Two plus years, mm -hmm. I called him. It was like, I don't know, midnight, one o'clock in the morning. And it was like, You know, I picked up. <laughs> <laughs> Played it off all cool. <laughs> but it was in that moment and that humble conversation and that vulnerable moment to say, like, we, we know what God's speaking to us. Like, we just, we gotta do it. I gotta, I gotta do it. I gotta get past this. And then that opened up kind of what the, what the future held. Yeah. And like you said, that was a hard season because it, it was difficult. People were hurt. And it wasn't really until the summertime Lauren went back to summer camp. Bishop said, Lauren needs to go to summer camp. And I was like, yes, Bishop. Okay. <laughs> and once again, in the mountaintop, away from the world, away from the distractions, God didn't just speak to her, but used her. And so, and you can say I'm biased, but there's a lot of people here that were at that summer camp, and they remember it was a natural fit. And then from that day, you know, it was like we, we said, okay, God, we're dying to ourselves. We are going to go down this road, and we're going to make it happen. And for me, I died to the controlling nature and said, okay, God, it's your process. It's your timing. Because God's will on our timing is not God's will. Yeah. We can ruin the will of God in our lives by trying to take over and hijack the process and do it on our timetable, do it our way, and, make, and taking that control. So for me, I died to the control, and she died, like she just said, to God's call on her life and to this completely different path and now this brings us to meet me at the altar chapter, chapter seven. seven we had hard work to do and we did. and you know some of you may be in pre-marriage or have gone through pre-marriage and you're like oh my gosh you guys make us talk about so much it's such a process there's a reason for it we experienced it like i 
I had so much work I needed to do on myself. I, that was a season for me of I needed to come wholly into the relationship. Not perfect, but I needed to be whole in myself so that we had a chance. Because yeah. I think it's also really easy to just gloss over things and like, oh, okay, I won't be controlling anymore. Like, okay, God, I trust you. But are we willing to roll up our sleeves and really do the hard work? Because that's where the change happens. That's where you need to like dig up some of the things of, of the past, some of the way you think about things. Like dig that God needs to dig them up so that you really can kind of heal and then and then move forward. And that was that was our season. Yeah. And the other part of that season was to enjoy the process and the seasons of that process, meaning we had to start dating and getting to know each other again and really cultivating that, as strange as it sounds, you know, look, that must be a Christian thing, but cultivating a friendship and beginning, you know, that and not rushing and thinking about marriage, you know, it was like, letting that go and enjoying that season. We began to serve alongside of each other, you know, in youth ministry and running youth ministry and being involved with the young adults. And that season was amazing. And I thank God for that season because sometimes we rob ourselves when we try to rush past the season into the next because God has a purpose in every single season in our life. And we need to embrace it. Right now we're doing the same thing of embracing a season with a toddler and an infant and not trying to just fast forward to, you know, until they're teenagers. Or out of the house, empty nesters. Or out of the house, empty nesters. Absolutely, the whole entire thing. So, Chapter you know, 8. So then we're going over a bunch of stuff in this season, but cultivating that, guiding that. And for me also was when we started that marriage counseling, for me to now begin to open my heart and to trust somebody else with my life, with my thoughts, with the things about me. I didn't want nobody to see or know that I will keep hidden because what if she didn't love me? What if she rejected me once she saw that part of me? And for her to then embrace it and love me even deeper when she saw all the cracks and bruises and the imperfections, that was when, man, it was on. And that's not just a pre-marriage thing, too. We talked a little bit about this yesterday with, um, with the people that were here. Like, those are, those are things that we've actually brought into our relationship, our marriage and other relationships that we have also. You know, sharing your heart and that, that idea of emotional oneness that, that we talked about. So it's not like you do the work then and then, you know, you're done. We've actually brought that into, you know, the various seasons. So it's, it's so important to be willing to do that and then take it with us. Yeah. And chapter 8, this final chapter that we we'll share with you today is the never-ending sleepover, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Because that's what Lauren used to say for years. It's like and, a sleepover yeah, every night. It's like a sleepover every night because there was so much joy and love. When God created marriage, he knew what he was doing. When God created sexuality and gave man to woman and created that oneness, he knew what he was doing. I remember hearing a quote from Pastor Edwin Lewis Cole, and he said simply, Ed, you know, he said, the closest we will ever get to heaven or hell on earth is by the person we decide to marry. And it struck me. It was one of the first, you know, when, when I first came to the Lord, I heard that, and I was like, yes. And for me, this season became paradise. This season to me became now I get to live heaven on earth because of what God has given. In those years of hard work, it was worth it all. Mm -hmm. I would go through them again and again. If you told me instead of two years, would you go through it for five years or ten years in order to have this, I would go through it. I don't want to, <laughs> but I would fight for whatever obstacle will put itself in the way to have the promise of God 
And God's promise is yes and amen for all of us. It's never too late. We, you know what's so cool about God, too? We, we ask a lot of times, what is your will? What do you want me to do? What, you know, what should I be doing? And God only gives us what we can handle. He only gives us what we can handle and what we need in that moment. He needed me to trust him with my heart, with my life. And he gave me a sliver of, you're going to have to be a, you know, that's a pastor's wife for now. Can you imagine if he told me what today looked like? I would still be running, you know, (laughs) but that's for all of us. Like God gives us, and it's a great, it's how gracious he is. He only gives us enough only gives us what we're really able to handle. And then what he does too, you know, we also say, well, you know, God, if you read in Psalms, God gives us the desires of our heart. God, this is what I desire right now. Why aren't you giving it to me? Because God doesn't just know who you are today and what you desire. God knows you as the person he's created you to be, the person you're going to be in 10, in 20, in 30, in 40 years. And, And the desires that he gives you actually map to the person you're going to be, not just the one you are now. So sometimes you say, well, why, God? Why are you answering my prayer? And he actually is because he knows what your heart is going to be desiring in the future. Before and you even know it. Before you know it. And that's where he lines up his promises and what he, what he gives to you. Yeah. So as we close here this morning, you know, maybe next year we'll do uh, part two of the love story because God is continuing right. all these things. But your story is not finished. My story is not finished. God is so gracious. God is so loving. He wants you to continue on this path. It, it doesn't matter if you're married for 20 years and you're like, well, I, we don't have that love. We don't have that oneness. It's not start today. Get it. Fight Get for it. it. You can be, man, I, you know, I'm, I'm dating, but I really don't know if this is God, you know, and I'd rather end it now than continue it. Well, then get some wise counsel if you don't have wise counsel, you know, and begin to be diligent in the things that God has promised you because they are worth it, especially in this area of relationships. None of us, it doesn't matter who we are, God is telling you it's too late. God is inviting you in and saying, I have a love story for you. And it's so much different than what you just heard today or the person sitting next to you. But nonetheless, it is a special anointed love story. Will you embrace it and say yes? Amen? Amen. I hope this was... uh, Did you guys enjoy it? At home, thank you. Let's stand on up. Let's pray. Now, you heard we have our pregame pre-game Super Bowl party right after church outside. So make sure you connect, you hang out, talk to others. You know, give my man Mike a hard time for wearing that Dallas jersey because he's a hardcore Giants fan. But let's pray. He lost a bet. (laughs) Lord God, we thank you for this day. I thank you every day for this love story. For your promises are yes and amen. And you are no respecter of persons because what you've done for me and for Lauren, what you've done for Bill and for Rachel, what you've done for everybody, Lord God, you have for everybody. None of us are on the outside looking in. You invite us all in. So right now, just take 30 seconds to talk to them and give them your yes. And let them back into the center of your love story. That first starts with him. And then those around you. We thank you, Lord God. In Jesus' name, amen. On your way out also, the ushers have a couple of sheets of paper with questions for married couples and for dating engaged couples. Grab them, we used them yesterday. These are great conversation starters for you to connect with one another. We love you, have a great week. We love you guys. We hope that you enjoyed our presentation. 
Would you consider partnering with us to share the hope of God and the love of Jesus by giving? You can give your gift at klcc.us forward slash give. Thank you for your generosity. Also, we would love to connect with you. So please follow, like, and subscribe to all of our social media platforms, as well as downloading our app on both the Apple and Google Play stores. Be sure to turn on notifications so you never miss a thing. Thanks for watching and see you next time.